Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program featuring reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is sponsored by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Sister Barbara O'Donnell on the environment. We will also hear more about the life of St. Thomas Becket and the readings for this feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about Dorothy Day House in Youngstown is Sister Anne McManaman. Joining me is Sister Anne McManaman, who is the founding person of Dorothy Day House here in Youngstown. And Sister Anne, it's very nice to have you here on Wineskins. And during this holiday time, but also in the midst of this pandemic that we continue to find ourselves in, how has what you've done at Dorothy Day House changed over these last 10 months or so? Oh my, that needs a whole book. (laughs) It's a big story, but I find it to be an inspiration for change and for development. Uh, And by that, I mean things that were very important to us in the justice scheme of educating each other, educating the world around us, was certainly the round table. We had over 110 round tables as we celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. And we always brought in an extraordinary speaker. Well, quite by force and accident, we ended up providing in place of our round tables some excellent national speakers that are available through particularly universities. I'll use the one that I listened to most recently, which was, by surprise, Loyola University. And the speakers were not given, but it was on the vote. And therefore, I was interested and chose it myself. Ended up that E.J. Dayan, those of you who are familiar with him, was the key team leader of the three people that presented on the Catholic vote. And I was so educated by it. It was a wonderful opportunity. So using that vehicle of freebies, I hate to say, but freebies that are of national interest. And it may be out of the generosity of the universities that they're offering this free, but many are. There may be one out of three or three out of six, but we're providing those to our public as part of our roundtable. And actually, I have to say, if people join in, they will be in disbelief regarding the quality of the speakers that are there and the education we each receive. So that that would be one way. The other is we discovered after a couple of weeks of shutdown, including my own shutdown where I couldn't go back to my mother house because no one could come in unless they were willing for the 14 days, we went searching for what could we do in place of the dinner because our dinner involved people coming in, sitting down at a china plate and a nice set of silver wearing glasses. Couldn't do it. So within a very short time, we discovered there were no meals of any kind, no food on Sundays. And we've been doing Sunday dinners now for, this will be our 18th week, I think. It's a big demand, but it's a great piece. We prepare some of those meals and pay for most of the food. However, we have some extraordinary people like Columbiana, which is far away, but very happy to help us out. So make a beautiful Sunday dinner and bring it in to be shared with people. A couple doctors who will go unnamed, but who've been extremely generous in offering a monthly meal. They too have prepared their own dinner. So those are two small things that help to make a change in our life, as well as Zooming each other and groups coming together and being very careful about sharing, sharing, sharing. And most of all, we have a prayer session every week on Thursday, and that is on Zoom. And I can't tell you the unique participants and the change to the good Mm -hmm. for all these things. You had mentioned those wonderful people who really volunteer their time and their service and even their treasure to help Dorothy Dayhouse. In the last few minutes, what would you like to tell the folks that are listening how they can help you continue to serve the community through Dorothy Day? Well, certain things come to mind right away. One of the biggest things we needed last year, and it was donated to us by money and by actual 
fundraising. St. Patrick's was the biggest player in that. And in addition to that, a number of individual people. But we now have this wonderful shed for outside. But I want to tell you that all the equipment for Sunday's meals, two tents and tables and microphone and so on, all in the shed. So the shed is not quite yet being used for what it was intended, but there you go. The second thing I think I would say is money is always the best thing to give and to send it to the Dorothy Day House of Hospitality. And that is because we have two corporate interests there. One is the land and the house, but we don't really want money for that. We want money for food and clothing. For example, every single Sunday, Mary Grace Manning prepares a bag for every single guest. And in that bag, you'll find shampoo, you'll find soap, but most of all, the guests want toilet paper. And so she buys and puts into those bags all of these little love items. Lately, because we got some t-shirts and briefs, which we ordinarily give out only to those who take showers, we're giving them to people who come through, anybody. Well, Sister Ann McManaman, we look forward to your presence again on Wineskins, where we could learn more about the wonderful things that you're doing at Dorothy Day House. But those who are listening, if they would like to contact you, how do they do that? They can contact by Dorothy Day House of Hospitality, Post Office Box 8. 863-44501 or my own number 330-301-8698 For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. The Feast of Thomas Beckett is celebrated on Tuesday. To tell us more about this bishop and martyr is Marianne Yeager. She is from St. Christine Church in Youngstown. Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury, was murdered in the cathedral on December 29, 1170. He was canonized in 1173. Born in London around 1118, he studied at Paris and returned to England after the death of his mother. At the age of 25, he became a cleric under the Archbishop of Canterbury and spent some time in Rome and Bologna before returning to France to study law. He became an archdeacon at the age of 36 and in 1154 was promoted to the office of chancellor under King Henry II, whose favor he enjoyed for seven years. He took part in the war against King Louis IV of France and distinguished himself in the assault of Toulouse. He was ordained priest and bishop in 1162 and was the first person in England to celebrate the solemnity of the Blessed Trinity. After becoming Archbishop, his personality changed and he became more reflective. At the same time, his relationship with the King deteriorated and the present Bishop of London added fuel to the King's growing dislike for Becket. The relationship grew worse when Becket resisted the King in the matter of church property and the right of clerics to be tried by the ecclesiastical courts. Becket refused to sign the document that severely limited the rights of the church, and he was abandoned by the bishops who wanted to maintain good relations with the king. Condemned for disobedience to the king, he fled to France, spent six years in exile. Pope Alexander II, meanwhile, needing the support of the king of France and King Henry of England, against the anti-pope, wrote three letters seeking reconciliation with the King of England, but received no response. Through the efforts of the Pope in 1170, a partial reconciliation was effected, and Becket decided to return to England. He carried with him the documents of suspension against the prelates who had counseled the King, and the excommunication of the Bishop of London. The implacable hate of both the bishops of London and of Salisbury reached the point at which they arranged for four knights to murder Becket. Although the clergy wanted to barricade the doors at the cathedral, Becket refused, saying, I am ready to die for the name of Jesus and the defense of the church. In 1170, he was struck down at the altar of the Blessed Virgin and St. Benedict. 
King Henry II was placed under personal interdict by the Pope and was absolved after his repentance in 1172. The death of Thomas Becket resulted in the reconciliation of the King of England with the Church, the King of France, and the Church at Canterbury. The story of the assassination of Thomas Becket spread throughout Europe and the East and became the subject of a drama by T.S. Eliot, Murder in the Cathedral. The opening prayer of the Mass is one that is proper to the Church of England. It states that St. Thomas Becket gave his life for justice, for freedom of the Church. In fact, Becket always fought for justice and freedom as Chancellor in defense of the King and as Archbishop in defense of the Church. Even though there were periods of uncertainty in his life, he had the courage to persist in his efforts even when abandoned by other bishops. For Wineskins, I'm Marianne Yeager. With me today is Sister Barbara O'Donnell, who is a Humility of Mary sister. And Sister, it's so wonderful to have you on Wineskins. I know that uh, you have been instrumental in many things at the villa, but also in your community. And we are going to talk today about the environment. And that is so crucial and so important. It's been part of our topic and discussion for many years, not only in the United States, but around the world. Why is it so important for us to really focus on the environment right now? Yes. Well, we have always been connected to our earth. And when Pope Francis wrote encyclical Laudato Si, praise be on care for our common earth. It was an invitation. The first time I read it, he invites us to gather for conversation, and then he invited different experts and professional people, knowing that we all had to be part of this interfaith dialogue. And as you say, Catholicism has always been, Scripture is part of who we are through Hebrew as well as Christian scriptures, the papal documents that have been written historically. And this last ecclesial letter comes from a worldview that Francis offers to us that is wider than what we have really lived. And it comes because he saw what we call the crisis, the ecological crisis. And over my time of study and learning, this is really a spiritual crisis because we have disconnected ourselves from the very source of life. And the divine is always present there and and certainly in creation Mm -hmm. offers the gifts that we have. And, you know, we call them natural resources. And that sounds like, okay, let's use it up. But a new language would be one-time endowments, God's gifts. So if we clear cut, then we want to plant new trees. It's that cyclical and reciprocal way of being. So the language is important. And this also, as I went through his book more than once now, ecological conversion. And that's not a one-time thing either. It happens to me a lot. Yeah, you know, when you're talking about conversion, we get the feeling sometimes it's a one-time thing, and it's almost like saying, well, I'm saved and that's it. But you need to do things on a daily, minute-to-minute basis in order to understand that conversion is ongoing. It's not something that happens one time, but it's an ongoing process. And the same thing is with our common home and Mm -hmm. care for that common home. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, okay, one day I'm going to recycle, but the next day I'm not. It's almost a constant effort that I've got to involve myself and engage Mm -hmm. myself in this common work in order to provide for the future. And why is that important for us to look ahead at those who follow us? Yes, generation after generation. And that is a base question. What will earth be like for our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and future generations of all species? And so to be attentive to that. And I've had many conversions. It's almost every day. Sometimes I just get out of my car and say, oh, wow, it's so beautiful. This is gift, you know, and I learned that as a child. My mom grew up on a farm south of Cleveland, and I never tired of her stories. Another language is that sense of integral ecology, Mm -hmm. that it becomes part of us. And that's the struggle, I think, that we have not integrated Mm -hmm. into our very being what this life means, that we Mm -hmm. would have no life without the water and the soil and the Mm -hmm. sun and the air. And when we look at the statistics, and I'm not very good with numbers, but it's overwhelming with the pollution of water and our soil that's unhealthy. And then 
all the systems that are broken down now, and when we have so much melting of the ice caps, I mean, obviously, the sea level has risen, and it's going to continue. There are people who have lost their whole islands and had to really petition to the mainland people to, can we be here with you? So our very source then invites us to be in God's presence, listening. And Francis says this very clearly, that we are losing the attitude of wonder contemplation, listening to creation. My favorite quotes of his, and you know, there are many quotes mm-hmm. to look at, to live by. And he speaks also of humility. He approaches this all with a humble heart. And when I think of humility and the root of humus, it's the end of composting. And it's also the root word of humanity and humor. So uh, there is no waste in nature. An eco-architect says that. And so that's part of our struggle. And Francis talks about overconsumption. You know, we need energy, we need things, we need some stuff. But when we don't have a limit to say, well, how can I have less and share more? Or do I need this? And what is it doing? We're not conscious. And that's the whole thing, Father Jim. I think it's that sense of being Becoming more conscious of who we are as humans in relationship to all else that is. And one other little point was when I learned about eco, when we hear ecological or ecology and economics come from the same root. And in ecology, eco means home. In economics, comes from the root that means management of the household. And so that was another deepening in me of what this is all about. So humility and wisdom and look back to scripture to the book of Job. You know, ask the animals and they will teach you. Mm -hmm. You know, the fish of the sea will tell you that that too, it's like we are part of, we're not separate from, and that we depend on. There needs to be a cooperative Mm -hmm. spirit from humanity rather than a dominating presence that we can do whatever we want. We can just just use it up and but one day it will be gone when you look at the oil you know it took billions and millions of years for the formation I, I call it the sacred evolutionary process and so we have to be aware and pay attention to alternative energies what we used to call alternative energies now it's renewable why is it important for us to be so ecological so aware not only of our surroundings and our climate but of one another and our interconnectedness in all of this. Yes, our whole being is created from the elements of earth and our heartbeat. I think of divine presence as God in me as a heartbeat. And then the heartbeat of earth, there's a rhythm to it. There's a pattern. There's been, you know, sustainable systems that have worked together. And now we have interrupted that and disturbed much of it. So I think it's that sense of also belonging. This is one home planet, common home. And to appreciate that, to give gratitude and to say, what can I do in my little ways to be part of this rather than to destroy, but to build up and to celebrate. Well, Sister Barbara O'Donnell, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And for your vast knowledge of why it's so important for us to pray with the environment and be part of the environment and to know that we are all in this together in our common home. And thanks for lifting that up today. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. To receive more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Father Jim Corda. On behalf of all of us at CTNY, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Christmas is a blessed time to remember the miraculous gift of God's love in Jesus, the newborn King. We recall the angel's message announced over 2,000 years ago. Today, in the city of David, is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. As we celebrate his birth, may his gifts of love and peace be born again in our hearts and homes this Christmas season. I am Marinol. Je suis Marinol. I am Marinol. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that it is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Marinol, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Marinol dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missionaries, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marinol. I am Marinol. Yo soy Marinol. I'm Father Mike. 
And I am Mary Noel. 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 Our song today is by the Kellenberg Memorial High School Choir. It is from their CD entitled, Come, Let Us Adore Him. Our scripture reflections for this Feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, will be by Father Nick Mancini. He is Pastor Emeritus of Sacred Heart of Mary Church in Harrisburg. Today we celebrate the beautiful Feast of the Most Holy Family. The beauty of family, family life, the joy of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, the model for all families. The joy of Christmas now gathering around, not only the manger scene, but the joy of a family, a family that touches our own families in our hearts, minds, and souls. The beauty of family life is seen not only in the Holy Family, but it must be a reflection of our own families. This modern world of ours truly has torn apart families. Families must be united in the love and the joy of the Christmas celebration to be lived every day. As St. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. And children, be obedient to your parents, growing with them in wisdom and knowledge as they teach you a way of life in the glory of the gospel message. Jesus followed that example. He listened to Joseph and Mary. He learned a trade, a carpenter's trade. And the family stayed together in that unit of love. They went to the temple together and prayed. They did things as a family and lived the joy of that beauty which God intended. Yes, the joy of family is the joy of being together. 
the joy of celebrating, the joy of love, of peace and harmony. Thus we see the light within our families that must be built on strength, the strength and the joy of Christ and of Joseph and Mary. Let us rebuild our families together in that faith, hope, and love by which this Christmas season fills us with the joy of family. As we gather together in the joy of the Lord, let us remember that the family that prays together will always stay together, and the light that this Christmas season has brought must be burning brightly within your homes. Love one another as families. Share the joy of family life. Enjoy one another in the peace of Christ. Yes, the Feast of the Holy Family reminds us of so many beautiful things you can do as family. Be together as family. Be one with the Lord. Worship together as family. And know the joy of the peace which He brings, the joy of family life. God bless our families, and may Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be your guide. For Wineskins, I am Father Nicholas Mancini. The family is here to stay, not only because God has decreed it, but because every one of us desperately needs it. It is a vital part of our lives, and there is nothing in the entire world that can ever take its place. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a blessed Sunday and a safe week. We of CTNY wish you and your loved ones a blessed and happy new year as we celebrate it this coming Friday. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.